Good deal. All right. Well, I do appreciate the opportunity to get the chance to talk to you all today uh, about something I think that if you if you have pigs, um, you know what the situation is. And there's two different kinds of folks in, in our minds is those that have them and those that will. So it's going to be one of those that if they don't have, if they're not there at your place this morning when you left, they may be there by the time you get back. So we're going to talk a little bit about the, the pigs themselves really quickly before we go on into the, 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 the concepts about the pig brig trap and such. Whenever you do have a break later on today, we do have one set up just out here across the drive that you can go out and put your hands on it and do the, the kick the tires type thing and, and uh, make sure that you, you have any other questions that we can ans answer. We'll be here the rest of the day. And, uh, and definitely Dan knows how to get in touch with us after we get, get finished today. So what we're gonna do, we're basically gonna run through first these first couple of slides pretty quickly. And, uh, and basically what we're gonna do is just set the stage for why they are what they are. And now we know that that, that map there is turning colors really, really quickly. Um, the biggest reason right now with that map turning colors the way it is and moving further up the chart, further down the chart, what you can't see there is in Canada, we've got five provinces in Canada where, where pigs are already pretty much dug in. Uh, the concern there is that they're moving across that northern border headed south more than so much the, the south moving north. But what we're looking at here is that 10 years ago, if you were to look at this map, the main reason for distribution across the map is the, the illegal transportation. People would come to the, to the south for numerous reasons um, to, to have fun, and one of them was to, to shoot pigs. So after they made a 25 mile or 25 hour trip from northern Minnesota or something like that and had a good time in the south shooting pigs, before they went, they come down here again, they just have a trailer load of hogs hauled up to where they were at illegally and, and turn them loose where they'd have something to hunt up there. So now though, you move that, that, that dial forward about 10 years, the number one issue we have for pig distribution and movement around the, the country right now is land fragmentation where in the past you'd have big tracts of property that were managed by a single management theory, single approach and so forth, and it somewhat kept pigs in check relatively um, uh, to, relative to the, to the surrounding areas. But now, uh, as the way that land is aired down over time, whenever somebody gets their hands on a thousand acres that they don't want to manage, what do they do with it? They chop it up into 25 acre blocks and they, uh, they sell it off and they're looking at the dollar signs. Okay, so what does that mean for the landowners surrounding you? Uh, if, if you're in the surrounding area, if you are the one that's, that's uh, five, six hundred acres away from that 25 acre block that's doing nothing, the pigs are going to be your problem. So in a lot of ways, those pigs are like roaches. They'll find a sanctuary area, they'll stay where they need to during the daytime, and as soon as the sun goes down, then they're gonna spread just like what roaches do. They'll come out of that sanctuary area where there's no pressure, and they'll impact big areas around you. Typically, what we see in, in studies on pig movements is a single sounder in a year's time, on an average, will occupy about 3,500 acres. Now, if the nutrition is not adequate, they can occupy, we've got telemetry data that will, that will tell us that pigs will occupy areas up to 19 square miles, okay? If they have adequate nutrition or ample nutrition, they may not get out of 500 acres in the whole year. So the, the thing is, is that you need to be mindful of what's going on, and, uh, and as people are buying up these smaller tracks and they decide they, they, there's no reason for them to do pig management on 25 acres, and you're 1,000 acres away from them, it's one of those things that, that the absence of management is going to be your problem moving forward. So whenever we think about pig management, we need to think about where they're at, where they're supposed to be. And sometimes whenever you look at people that's got some long initials behind their names, that's probably the most ignorant one in the group. Okay? And, uh, and what I mean by that is if you look at that map, what that says there is those hot colors is where they think pigs will live and the, blue, and the cooler colors is where they said pigs won't live. Well, you look at those blue colors and what we said in that first slide is what's above those blue colors, north of those blue colors? Canada, all right? So when we start thinking about pig movement and, and Canada, and those pigs are dug in in Canada, but what you can't see in that map is those little black dots, especially if you're further back, that upper peninsula of Michigan is covered in little black dots. And what that means is breeding populations in the area. Well, if that map says there that they shouldn't be there, then why the heck are they, they breeding populations there? It's basically because the adaptability of the species, there's nowhere they can't go. The number one limiting factor on pig movement and distribution is water. If they have enough water, they're going to find enough food to stay alive, okay? So if you put a water trough on the Walmart parking lot, they can pick up enough french fries to stay alive, okay? So that's something that they're never going to stay out, but the, the concern is there that, that there's no, no place that we found yet on the planet other than Antarctica that pigs don't adapt, that they don't survive. So as we go in forward with this, some of the basics really, really quickly. 
How many of you have seen the TV shows out there, Pigs Gone Wild or The Hog Bomb or anything like that? You seen any of those things like that? How much can you take as fact in those programs? The commercials. That's crap information just to sell ratings. All right. So when we start thinking about the pig basics, a lot of places that I get the chance to go. Before I worked for Pig Brig, I was I worked for Texas A&M University, and that's how I came to know Pig Brig. And and I would go to a lot of places around the state, and around the country, and be met with people from different places and had full intentions that they know what, what was going on. But typically, a conversation would start out with, "Well, you know." And whenever I hear the conversation start out with, "Well, you know," I know I'm about to get educated. Okay. So whenever somebody would say, well, well, you know, if I followed that comment up with, well, that's interesting, that means I thought that you were full of it, okay? That that was just not, not factual based stuff. So what we're gonna do, cover some basics really quick, is that whenever we first started seeing pigs become an issue back in the 1930s in the South, it's because what was going on in the 1930s with, with regard to the economy? The, well, the depression, okay? We had depression in the 1930s. In the past, and in that time frame, we had people that had large track sizes, right? Large acreages. So that's when we've seen the astronomical increase in the number of deer leases scattered across the country that were, were popping up everywhere. Well, if you had the chance to lease property, if you were lucky enough to have money in that time, you didn't want to sit around a campfire and tell lies, right? You wanted to shoot at something. So in the 1930s, with that, that drastic escalation of the number of deer leases popping up, popping up on private property, the, the landowners were then importing in pigs to turn into shot opportunities. So that's whenever we saw the, the numbers just astronomically increase, and that was because of hunting-related uh, recreation and the need to have more things out there to shoot at. Now, we'll get into some of these with the myths real quick. I hear the thing all the time says, well, you know, Pigs are going to have three litters a year. That's interesting. Okay? We need to think about the situation with a pig and the reproductive capabilities of them. And, and what we need to think about that is what do we tell our young people about the gestation of a pig? It comes in threes. Okay? Three months, three weeks, and three days. 115 day gestation. All right? So if you were to have three litters in a year, three full gestational cycles in a year with 115 day gestation, what does that need, mean that you need to have just in gestational days alone? 345 days. That means that sow would just about have to lay down, squirt out a litter of pigs, stand up and rebreed. Physiologically, that is not possible. It's just the same reason why you don't have a calf born every nine months out of your cattle herd. It takes her three or so months to get her body put back together. Okay, so when we hear people say that's three liters in a year, not, no, not really. No, not, not at all, not, not really, but about a liter and a half is what we're looking at. So if you've got adequate nutrition, and what I tell people is that how do you know if you've got adequate nutrition? Do you have good looking four year old bucks on your property? Do you have does having twins? Do you have fat calves out there? Do you have fat livestock? Do you have good hay fields and good, good crops? What is an indirect beneficiary of you being a good manager? A pig. Because if everything that you're managing for is healthy, what else is going to be healthy on there? Everything else. So if you got adequate nutrition on your property, we can probably get two liters a year out of that sow. We may get two liters out of that sow for two, three years in a row. But at some point, she's going to say, I've had enough. My body is tired. I got to put it back together. And she's going to roll it back to one liter a year, regardless of nutrition. Okay, so what the situation is there is as an average across the whole country and most of the planet is about a litter and a half a year, all right? Average again of about six piglets. The challenge is with those six piglets out of the tens of thousands of pigs that I've looked at, whether domestic or, or, or wild, is if you look at a thousand piglets, once you get through checking the gender of a thousand piglets, you're probably gonna have pretty close to 50-50 male to female, okay? So if you've got a litter of six pigs out there, you're probably going to have three little girls in it, all right? Which comes to the next situation there that what, I, what we need to think about there. That it says there on that, that far right side, four to six piglets. That, that is completely, completely dependent on nutrition, all right? Nutrition is the number one factor that drives reproduction. Think about it with your cow-calf operations or your deer or anything like that. If they're poor nutrition, they're not going to breed, okay? Pigs are the same way. So the other thing that comes up there that, that, that typically starts out again was, well, you know. Well, you know, that old, that old female, she's going to put that first litter of pigs on the ground at six months of age. That's interesting, okay? Because if we look back at the gestational period of a pig was what? Three, three, and three, right? If it's three months, three weeks, and three days, that's just a few days short of four months. 
So if you take six months and you roll it back four months, when did she have to breed? She basically had just finished weaning herself before she had to breed. I'm sorry, they're reproductively fit, but they're not going to be breeding at two months of age. Okay? Now, what that will tell you, though, is if the nutrition is good, you got does throw or raising twins, you got good looking young bucks, you got fat cows, fat calves. What that will tell you is if that nutrition is available and adequate, by the time she hits her first birthday, she will definitely have a litter of pigs on side or about to pop with a litter of pigs. So typically, whenever we see a reproductive onset for, for, for wild pigs, We'll start really watching them at six months of age. If their nutrition is adequate at six months of age, it's very possible that she can, have, she can breed at that point, not have a litter, okay? So whenever we start thinking about that, it's just take that, take that information. It doesn't matter if it's a wild pig or a domestic pig, they're gonna still perform the same way. Same gestational period, same everything else. The other thing to think about this with regard to the domestic population is Georgia has got a lot of pigs, domestic pigs, okay? We cannot with good animal husbandry, with pharmaceutical drugs, with good nutrition in a domestic swine barn, we can't get a domestic guilt to have pigs at six months of age. So how is it if we can't get them, the domestic animals to perform that way, how could we expect a wild animal to do better than a domestic animal that has no assistance from us, okay? So we start putting some of these things together and, and think about that kind of close. Now the next thing down on that bottom line, Evidently, them old females out there running around are some pretty good party favorites, right? Because what that says on that bottom line right down there is 60% of the litters out there are sired by more than one boar, okay? So whenever you got that female comes into heat out there, that litter that she's carrying may have two, three, four, five different boars that's responsible for pigs in that litter. What's that going to do to hybrid vigor? Okay, whenever we start talk, talking about crossing things up and, 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 and moving pigs in the direction that where they're at, is, is if you've got the same bull and he breeds back to the cow and then he breeds back to his daughter and then he breeds back to his granddaughter, what's that gonna do eventually with the reproductive efficiency of those offspring? They shut down, right? There's no vigor. But whenever you've got a single litter that could have multiple sow, multiple boars in there, the hybrid vigor is there where there is none of that, that fall off genetically to where their, their reproduction is gonna, is gonna slack. We do see some of that happening in Europe where pigs are native. Uh, that in Europe, that Russian boar strain can get pretty narrow, pretty, pretty skinny, and we can see some of that issue there. All right, so a couple of these things out there we can pass up. The main thing there that we said already is range expansion depends solely on water. If you got water, they can scratch out a living to do some other things that's out there that they wanna do, number one being breeding. Okay, the thing that we're here for, I think today, most of y'all are here because of an interest in the wildlife side of things. All right, whenever we start thinking about that in, in, in ecosystem impacts, we have a situation here with a pig with resource competition. And what I mean by resource competition is food and habitat. Okay, so whenever we look at what a pig is, they're, they're considered an, uh, an opportunistic exotic omnivore, which means that opportunistic, they're gonna take advantage of anything they can take advantage of. They're exotic, means they're not supposed to be here. And being an omnivore, they're gonna eat anything they can wrap a lip around, right? So what we're thinking of when we're looking at resource composition with regard to wildlife species is if they're out there and they can run across a set of uh, a, a turkey nest, what are they gonna do to those eggs? They're gonna eat them. They can run across a quail nest. What are they going to do to those quail eggs? They're going to eat it. But in the situation, right, that, that's even a bigger concern with regard to turkey reproduction, quail reproduction, and things like that, is habitat selection. Because whenever you look at those other birds that are ground nesting birds, and they come through, that, that old hen turkey is not going to lay down or sit down right there and squirt out 10 eggs at one time, right? She's going to lay an egg today. She'll go out and feed around, do her thing, and then she'll come back and lay another egg tomorrow. She'll go out, feed around, come back the next day, and lay a little egg the next day, okay? So at any point before she actually starts to sit on that nest, if a pig comes through and wipes it out, what does that mean she's gonna have to do now? Is she gonna come back and use the same nest location? No, it's habitat selection. Habitat selection, now she's gonna have to find another location that is, is acceptable for a nest location. Well, what if that property only has limited locations that's nest available or nest suitable? She may go from nest site one that was desirable, that she may go to other places on that property and only lay one egg and then realizes this ain't where I need to be. So you may have a huge fall off in your turkey and quail populations just because they can't find a place that's suitable to have that clutch of eggs. They'll bounce around if those, those pigs take out those early clutches. The other concern that's out there right now too 
is, is are people out there in the country right now making some pretty good money on deer? Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's private land that you're leasing out or if it's deer breeding facilities or anything like that. So what we need to think about with regard to that, how many, how many deer fawns were born in this county last spring? There's no way to know it, is it? Okay, so how do we know what the possibilities are with regard to deer? And whenever I'm talking about deer, I'm speci speaking specifically about the fawn side of things right now. When we start thinking about that, one thing that we can use to basically kind of get an idea of what goes on with the possibilities with deer and pigs is looking at the livestock side of it that we know that we can quantify, okay? We can go out there and we can quantify the number of livestock births in a year because they're in a pasture. We can go out there and count the heads, right? Well, what we need to think about is that we know right now that the wild pig is the number two predator on kid goats and lambs only behind the coyote. Okay, so if they're the number two predator on kid goats and lambs only behind the coyote, then what do you think is going to happen whenever they run across a little slab of venison laying on the ground? Okay, they're going to eat it. They're an opportunistic omnivore. If they're the number two predator on kid goats and lambs, and we can quantify that, we don't know how many deer fawns is born out there, but we can tell if they can get up on that fawn and it can't outrun that pig or it's too young to it thinks it just needs to lay there, it's going to get eaten. Okay. So, and once they find places that does are more prone to leave their, their fawns staked out, they'll stay in that area and they'll comb that area through until they get every single one of them. Okay? So that's something to kind of keep in mind. If you're out there and, and you're pumping a lot of nutrition into those deer, a lot of time, a lot of effort and everything else, but you're not thinking about the predatory side of things with regard to pigs, then you're probably selling yourself a little bit short. Okay? We know that they go in there and they love to eat your food plot stuff, right? Root your seed up, tear everything else up there. That's pretty obvious. But whenever you don't know the number of deer fawns that you had put out on your land in the, in the spring of the year, you really don't know what the impacts are. Because we typically never see those deer fawns until they get big enough to follow that doe, that doe around, right? And a lot of times those does that we see follow walking around out there, and she's a big fat doe, and she's walking around in August with no fawns, then what's the first thing that comes to our mind about that doe? She's eating a lot of my groceries and she ain't putting nothing on the ground for me. Okay? Well, she's probably put twins on the ground for you. And either between the coyotes and the pigs, she's done lost them both. Okay? So that's some of those things that's out there that, that most, most don't realize the, the situation that pigs face with regard to the deer and the direct predation on there. The other thing that the, the, the previous uh, discussion talked about there is a little bit about chronic wasting disease. One of the things that we need to kind of keep in mind now that's become a huge monster in the deer world is the fact of, of how pigs affect chronic wasting disease. Pigs do not succumb to CWD, okay? But what we have found out that the pigs can move the CWD prions to different places scattered around, all right? Those, those prions are spread through, through ground contamination or through ground contact and so forth and so on. So we can be managing a piece of property to keep that desired four to six inch stubble height to keep the nose from direct con contact with the ground. But in situations you got pigs and they go and they root the ground up, then we have no choice but nose to ground contact. Now they could be moving those prions and from one location to the next and they're completely un not unsusceptible to those, to those prions that are catastrophic to the deer population. So when we're thinking about some of those situations that's out there with regard to pigs and the movements and, and possibilities there, it's very, very staggering, very disturbing, okay? The other thing that what we do know now too in recreational land, whenever it's regard to recreational land and some of you may be looking to buy land or you're looking to sell land in that recreational capacity, if there is anywhere either your property or surrounding properties or even nearby properties that's a little further out that have had a positive situation with CWD on there, your, re your retail value of that particular property goes at least half of what it was, okay? Because now some of the, the, the places where CWD was identified first in Colorado in 1967, they still have the prions in the ground that's there from 67. So once it's an infected or a contaminated surface, uh, ground level there, then uh, it's not like something you can go out there and disinfect it, you can till it up, you can do whatever else. You've got a problem. And, and once that information gets out there and you're trying to sell a piece of property, the, the value of that property is going to be catastrophically cut. So uh, some of those to keep in mind, the other things out there is definitely your, predator, your, your vertebrate species with your smaller little critters that are out there. Um, pigs affecting the, the nesting birds, even in the trees, that if they have those specific niche feeders that feed on just nothing but a, a, a uh, evolved insect pest, that they feed their chicks their insects, 
Um, if they're coming in and that insect is involved over a certain plant community, pigs tear out that plant community, it also affects the, the bug situation there, and that then results in fewer bugs for those, those those birds to feed to their their uh, nesting chicks. So anyway, what we'll do, we'll move on here uh, we, on the ecosystem impacts. The other thing that we didn't hit on real real hard right now, though, uh, that needs to be made sure that you're aware of is the the, the contamination to uh, uh, the water so the water sources that are there. We know that the pigs are the number one contributor to bacterial infect or bacterial contamination in our waterways with regard primarily to E. coli. Uh, pigs are are about four times more. I guess potent than what even a cow would be in contributing E. coli into your water systems, especially in those riparian areas that are such hard situations to manage for anyway. Cultural impacts is a major issue. Some of y'all, if y'all like to play golf, uh, if you got pigs in the area around your golf course and you see your tea time, your, your, your fees, your green fees going up, that's probably why, is if you get these pigs into some of these fairways and greens and things like that, it is unbelievably expensive to get them fixed. So whenever they get those places fixed, uh, then guess who they're gonna pass the, the fee along to? It's gonna be whoever's out there swinging on a Saturday or Sunday morning. Ag impacts, we know that there's, they're, they're unbelievably catastrophic on ag and, uh, and, and to the tune of somewhere in a $2.5 billion range um, per year. And, and so what the situation is on the ag side of things is that we know, and this has been a popular belief for a long time, that they're only affecting the farmer and rancher, they're not affecting anybody else. Well, I have a buddy of mine that passed away a few years ago. He said they're going to affect people if you live in a home, if you wear clothes, or you eat. All right? Because if the farmer that's producing the food for us takes it in the back pocket, where are those costs going to be pushed onto? Anybody buying something off the shelf? Okay, so there's some of the concerns to kind of keep in mind that whenever you hear those farmers there and they're talking about, about hard times and such like that, the pigs are getting to be a, such an issue there that we just, we, we're, we're, we're stumbling and staggering to try to make ends meet. We did already talk about that one, so we're not going to really worry too much about it as much more in, in, as, as we're moving through there, but that, that whole issue there is that whenever you can get some people in these deer breeding facilities that they can insure a buck for a million dollars, that, that's pretty staggering. Uh, some of the lease fees that some people are getting right now, if you're going to continue to get those lease fees, you better be able to make sure you still have adequate quality in your deer populations that are on there, your deer herd the size and so forth. And, uh, and who knows what that little, that little fella right there could turn into if you give him a little bit of time to develop. But if a pig finds him, you won't ever know. Okay, environmental impacts, we talked a little bit about that, the water quality, wetland functions, things and like that. We do see big, big changes there, that third bullet down big changes in timber environments with regard to timber and seed regeneration. Pigs like to eat those large seeds, right? Oaks, pecans, things like that. And in those areas that they're heavy oak and pecan forest, and we see those, those regeneration uh, tendencies catastrophically plummeting to now where we have elm and hackberry primarily uh, because there's just not any regeneration happening whenever pigs get a foothold in there. Okay, then uh, let's so we're going to move on. Diseases. The, we talked a little bit about the CWD. We talked a little bit about some of the other the the, the ones with regard to um, the, the the challenges with residential property values and things of that nature. The other thing that we need to keep out there in mind is that that if those of you out there that are kind of like me, if I get a good fat animal that comes out of the deer feeder and I and I rehabilitate that dude with a hot lead injection, he's probably going to find his way to my barbecue pit. Okay. Now, some of the, and you got people on both ends. Either they're going to definitely eat it, they definitely not. All right? So the thing to keep in mind with regard to, to eating wild pork, there has never been a documented case by the Center for Disease Control from somebody infecting themselves, being infected from eating properly cooked wild pork. Okay? Infection possibilities are at the time of processing. So if a pig has got a disease, you cannot walk up and look at that pig and say, that pig's got X disease. No way to tell, all right? You walk up and see a skinny pig laying on the ground, it could very well be just because there's not enough out there to eat, okay? But the, what I tell people is if they, look at, if they look at a pig laying on the ground deciding whether or not to put him on the barbecue pit and there's any question in their mind as to whether or not to eat him, throw that dude away. We got about six million more, go get another one. Okay, go find something else to eat. So, but the thing is, is that whenever people are scared about contracting diseases from eating properly cooked wild pork, put that out of your mind. It's not an issue.
okay? But if you are thinking about uh, processing that wild pig and you don't want to wake up in the next morning with that little nervous twitch that you don't know where it come from, you may want to put on some gloves and some things like that to keep that body, those body fluids out of your eyes, off your hands, things like that. So um, the other thing that's just catastrophic and I think that's just unbelievable about pigs is whenever we hear the word anthrax, it usually makes our body shiver a little bit. Pigs are not susceptible to anthrax. That's another one that's a spore-borne disease, spore-borne issue, that they can transport those, those spores around, do whatever they need to do, but they will not succumb to that disease. So that's something that's just phenomenal about it. Management methods, we'll get in here real quick. All right, so the main thing is, is I'm gonna tell you right now, pig traps, guns, aerial gunning, even the toxicants now, where I, I live in Texas, okay? It's a big buzzword right now. We want that silver bullet toxin. There's nothing gonna be a silver bullet. The way that you get in front of the pig situation is an integrated approach. In, my, in, in wildlife, we call it an adaptive approach. Because integrated is something we can put on a calendar, like when we, we deworm cattle or we castrate calves. We can put it on a calendar. When we're managing for wildlife, everything is applied or adapted based on the conditions rather than what the date is on the calendar. So when we start managing for pigs, it needs to be that adaptive strategy too. But we need to think about multi, multiple pronged approach to, manage, to managing those pigs. Now, if what you're wanting to do is just catch a pig to put in with your deer sausage, fine. You can get any trap you want to that'll fit between the wheel wells of your pickup and you can shut the tailgate and you catch enough pigs to be, able to, to be able to make with your deer sausage. But if you're really wanting to move numbers, size is the key on the traps. The ability to catch a bunch of pigs in a short period of time is the, tra is the key. The only thing I will say about the toxicant side of things, and, it, and it's, if, it's a tool in Texas now, it's gonna be one of those tools that's not for everybody, but one thing about the silver bullet approach to the toxicant consideration is that Australia has been using that same toxin for about 15 years now. And the one thing it's done for them in about 15 years is now they pushed their pig population in Australia to north of 24 million. And in October, they just hired a, a, a pig czar for Australia, that their responsibility is pigs. So if the toxin was working that well, then they wouldn't have the situation that they're happening or they're having. And the other thing with the toxin is they don't discriminate. And, and that any of those, those concerns that are there, um, is, it should be obvious. So what's gonna happen with the toxins is they're gonna have to be fed with a, 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 a feeder that's a magnetized feeder to try to, to, to remove the possibility of non-target contamination, non-target species there. Again, too, it's gonna be a tool. Decide if that's something that's gonna fit for you or work for you, but remember, if you're waiting on a silver bullet to come out to, to control your pigs, by the time you realize that's not the silver bullet, you're just gonna have more pigs. All right, so now, trap evolution. This is something that very commonly we saw quite a long time ago, still see it today, is if you got the old dog kennel in the backyard that you ain't using for a dog kennel anymore, we put a trip string on it, catch a pig. All right, how long is that gonna hold a pig? So we have a lot of that evolution that started in that form and fashion there. there. And then I will say this, is when we got to the point of having that, that drop style trap that's there on the side, that was literally a huge advancement in the positive direction. Because with those animal activated trigger, like what you see on that left hand side there, the, fit, the pigs that typically got caught were the greediest pigs in the bunch. The ones that you really need to catch, those big broody females that were a little nervous about it, they were typically still on the outside of the trap and they caught those greedy pigs that jumped through that gate, hit that trip string, and now all we did is just to continue to educate those big females on the outside. Whenever we started using these smart traps where we could actually dictate when that trap was activated, we could, if we were patient enough, to wait till those pigs got into that trap, drop that trap, drop the gate, whatever we could, remove the whole sounder, okay? That worked well for quite a while, and then now we got to the point where we got a lot of people that's out there that's like, you know, I got 10 out of 18, I'm gonna go ahead and drop it, boom and they drop it, now we've got a situation where we got pigs that are getting smart to some of those trap types. Uh, the other thing that's happened a lot of times too, guys, I'll tell you this, don't share your camera access with your buddy. Because what happens is there's a lot of guys out there that share their camera access to their buddy at their drop traps, or their, their smart traps, and the buddy's looking at it on the camera thinking, man, he must be asleep. He's not gonna catch all these pigs, I'm gonna go ahead and catch them for him. Hit the button and boom, they drop the trap, okay? So in the whole time he was watching them in the, from, from day one. So big, big changes in being able to remove large numbers of pigs whenever those smart traps hit the market. And, uh, and I don't know if this will help me play this or not. But, uh, but anyway, that's what the, we'll see, see if it'll, if it'll play.
Now it's not gonna let me play it. Anyway, but anyway, that was all it was, is just to show you how that, that, that style is, where you got the two trot, the two catch gates on the top side of there. Uh, one of the things we will go ahead and talk about here, and I don't know what I've done to it now. Uh, There we go. Okay, so now what we're going to do here is look at this. This is the concern of what we got with regard to, if you got smart traps out there, one of the first things that I would, I would do is if you got that that single gate system, you, you're wasting your time. Because what's going to happen is the same thing what that pig is doing there on that left-hand gate there is a trap do, a dominance or a trap avoidance, whatever you want to call it. And what's happening is that pig is acting almost like a bouncer at a bar. And they're only going to let certain pigs through that gate that they want to. So if you want to make sure that you have access to those other pigs coming through that gate, you've got to put in the back door, right? So if you can't come through the front door because the bouncer's there, but you still want to get in, you just find the back door. All right, so those single gate systems like that are tough to know that you're going to catch everything, uh, especially if that, the one that's guarding the door don't want you in. So other things that we look at there is on the smart trap side of things is one, you've got to have cell phone signal, you've got to have data plans, you've got to have other things like that. There ain't nothing that's going to make you talk funny and use some pretty clear, pretty colorful adjectives than to go in there to set up a trap, get everything set up, flip the camera on, and have no signal. All right. So that's a, those are some some issues that we need to think about. The other things we talked about are, uh, are educating the pigs and uh, and the potential of animal welfare issues. And that's one of the things that what we have to think about uh, in a growing uh, frequency around the country where we're at now is, is the the folks that are concerned heavily concerned about animal welfare. Um, because there's no faster way to get a bad image really quickly than somebody putting an a, a picture of, a, of, a, of an animal getting hurt one way or another. Okay, so that's a big issue that we have to, to consider ourselves with. So what I'm saying is you better make sure you check your Facebook friend group before you start posting videos of a, of a catch gate falling and, and squashing a pig. All right, uh, let's see here. What else we got in here? And then also, too, the, the issue there is once that catch gate is closed, how many more pigs are you going to catch? That's it. Once the door's shut, there's nothing else going to be able to get in there. So whenever we start thinking about the net trap systems, uh, let's see, I don't know, I don't know if I even want to try that. Uh, but whenever we start thinking about the net trap systems, is we got to think about the, the, um, the possibilities there of a continual catch. I don't know if it's going to let me do it again. Anyway. So I guess the main thing what you can see on the video, what it was going to play is the same thing that we got up on the booth video over there. It's the way that that, that trap works, the way the net trap works that's out here is that, that the, there's a 360 degree catch area. There's not a catch gate on it. When the trap is activated, it's set on the ground, the net's on the ground, and it's basically the concept of a fish trap. So the pigs can continue to go in there. That does not depend on a cell phone signal, does not depend on data plans, it does not depend on you staying up all night long to watch a camera to, sit the, to push a button. So basically you set the trap in the afternoon, get it baited up the way you want to, go to bed that night, wake up the next morning, go get your pigs. So. Um, the, the thing, the still the same concepts are hold true with a net trap is the number one most important step in the whole trapping process, regardless of the trap type, is, is adequate conditioning. If you want to go in there and catch big numbers and, and make a bigger dent, don't try to push a pig to do something that they don't want to do. The more you push the pigs, you got the chance of pushing them away. So whenever our bigger catches happen, it's when we put plenty of uh, attention to the conditioning steps, the conditioning phase. So in the, in the net trap, there's only one size. The size is what's out here. And that net trap, the biggest trap catch that we've made so far is 78 pigs at one time. So, and it, like I said, it functions just like a fish trap where that net's on the ground, the pigs continue to push under it, slides up, slides down, and, uh, and they just don't get back out. It's a one-way type deal. So multiple set, multiple sounder catch. Uh, the, the library of videos that we've got with one of them on the booth over there, is that, that if there's an adequate bait in the trap, you catch the first sounder, 
that once that sounder pushes through, another sounder can come by, it's still actively set, they can push in, they can go through again. So the 78 catch that we had was four sounders over four hours. Sounder one come through, work their way in there, fed, eat, come in the trap, stayed there for a little while, here comes sounder two, and they work their way in, so forth and so on. So it's one of those that, that, that as long as you watch the cameras determine where you have those, those multiple sounders, there's a whole different training level on that and, and catching those multiple sounders, okay? We've always been focused in pig management on trying to catch the biggest group first, right? In a lot of ways, that that's the exact opposite of what we do with the net trap. If we know we have overlapping sounders, we go to the place where we can catch that smaller sounder and have the chance of that bigger sounder coming by a second. Because if we catch that first sounder, that smaller sounder, and the bigger sounder comes by, it's a dominance issue in addition to the nutritional side. If there's a, a resource that that bigger sounder wants to get to and there's a small sounder on it, the pigs themselves become the bait. Okay? So then they can continue to come into that trap. So it's a whole different approach to being able to remove a large number of pigs in a short period of time. Okay? Uh, so basically with that net trap too, is, is if what I tell people is whenever you go out there and how, what, how many traps do I need, what do I need to have? Until you know for sure what your situation is, if you have one net, you can have three locations. And then we can show you how the thing, the thing's set up out there where you can take the measuring strap that comes with the trap, take the T-post, you go set the T-post up, three different locations, leave the net at the house. Wherever the pigs show up at, you go get the net hanging. For those of y'all that are hunting and trapping on deer leases and places like that, I know you don't want to drive post in the, in the, in the October or September, October time frame to blow your deer out. I wouldn't either. If you're going to use post like what's set up outside, go put the post in the ground in June and July. And then whenever it gets closer to deer season, when you feel like being out there, just slide into that area, hang that net, slide back out. And you don't blow anything out. But the way the trap was developed is not even using post like what we have out here. The way the trap was developed was to use the trees. The way it was developed is an in-house product that we have for projects that we were working on and the project that we developed the, the, the trap system on was a project that we have ongoing in Guam. And, and in Guam, the opportunity of using posts is illegal, okay? In Guam, posts are illegal, digging holes are illegal because of unexploded ordnance still in the ground from World War II. All right, so we had no choice but to use the trees to attach traps to, and early on, we having to use prefab metal panels to attach to a tree, and all of y'all in the south, you know that you can't get good ground contact with something attached to a tree in a prefab panel. The pigs would go under the panel. But with that net, we could attach it to the trees, and it would conform to the ground, to the roots, to whatever else, and there's no gaps for those pigs to go under. If I'm using trap set, if I'm using tree sets, which is what I do now about 90% of the time, I use, I'm in there and out of there in about 20 minutes with a complete tree set up. And for a lot of those that are using them on deer leases, that's an excellent way. Don't put the trap up right where the, the deer feeder is, okay? Go a quarter of a mile away, go somewhere else away, have your trap set location completely away from there, all right? You can slide in there, slide out, put your tree sets up, and then you can get it, get, uh, you don't blow your deer out and keep high efficiencies. So I think that's what I'm getting pretty close. I don't know what time it is. I'm getting, getting pretty close to when I'm, I'm running out. Um, again, like I said, we'll be here all day. Um, answer your questions, go out and do, like I said, the, the walk around, the kick the tire test on the trap outside, take a look at it, and, um, and come by and ask us questions. Uh, anybody have any questions right now? Yes, sir. Is there a good time of year to trap? Good time of year to trap? Well, there, there's peaks and valleys. Um, for, for, and it's going to depend on resources. Basically, what I tell people is in the fall of the year, if you've got an acorn crop or pecans hitting the ground, don't waste your time, all right? Typically, right now, if you've got good green spring growth going on, then it's probably not going to be a peak time. If you've got drought conditions, stress conditions, the efficiencies go through the roof. So in the summertime, whenever it gets hot and you can get trapped in somewhere closer to water, your efficiencies go up, the nutrition has gone down. And the winter time of the year, for me, is probably the best time. And that's after, usually December 1st is when I tell people to really start looking. Because most of the places that we go is by December the 1st, whatever acre crop or pecan crop you had for that fall has been picked up. Uh, the things are out of the way. Your weekend warrior deer hunters have already turned their feeders off and gone about Thanksgiving. Okay, so a lot of that, that corn that's been dumped on the ground is gone. It starts to get, it gets a little tough on those pigs. Other things that's going to happen in that, that winter time frame is when there's ample nutrition in the fall of the year, those sows are going to quickly go into reproductive health. So once they go in, they gain weight quick off those early pecans and early acorns on the ground, they're going to start breeding. 
Well, by the time that, that, that fall nutrition runs out, they're heavy bred or they got pigs on side, and now they're even hungrier. So they're ready to be caught. They're looking for it. So basically, I tell people that for me, the biggest peak that, that to work on those pigs is basically from, if you want to put it on a calendar, December the 1st till spring green up. And then during the time of year from spring green up until about June the 1st, something like that, you got a little bit of a lull in some places if you got plenty of rainfall because they got a lot to eat. Okay? They've been struggling all winter long trying to find good, good nutrition. Spring of the year, there's that flush of nutrition. That's the time of year I tell people, start maintenance in your equipment, reviewing your records. Where did I catch pigs at last year? Where are they going to be at this year? Possibly, possibilities like that. And, and get ready for that summer time frame. So you're going to definitely have peaks and valleys in there, but review what your situation is particularly. And then also, too, know what your neighbors are doing. Okay? If your neighbors are out there, you got a smaller piece of property, and they're out there banging away on the weekend shooting skeet, that you're probably going to have those pigs a little bit more aware than what they normally would be. So, um, any other questions? All right, guys. I appreciate it.